Happy Friday. I uh, said, well, Pastor, why are we here? Do we have a special announcement? We do. Here it is. Uh, people have noticed that I haven't got my hair cut in a while, and they're asking, why is your hair so long? I just want to inform you of a new Nazarite vow that I took. It's called, I don't have time to go to the hair stylist. And so I'm going to get there pretty soon. So for those of you who think my hair is getting a little long, which one precious saint told me, um, I'm going to get it cut one of these days, and soon I will look as good looking as Sean and uh, all the other guys around here that go to the stylist or their own clippers more often. You'll, yes, it's true. People actually comment on my hair, but that's okay. It's kind of nice. At least they noticed. And uh, one guy saw me the other day. He'd only seen me on uh, tape or, you know, stream. And he said, wow, you look different. And I said, well, what about it? And he said, your hair's longer. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, um, I'll get there. So just want to assure you that the critical things of life are getting taken care of. Now, why are we really here? Well, this weekend we're coming into a transition. And the transition is we're kind of coming out of the parking lot on Sunday mornings and we're coming in uh, to inside Sunday mornings, 9 and 1030. Jonathan already talked to you about all of that. So I don't want to go over those details because he's already done that on the previous midweek. What I want to talk about is the questions that people, what about the mask? What about the vaccine? What about those issues as we're coming into them? I am not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, but I think this may be kind of a rough fall. It's rough in the sense that clearly COVID is increasing. Um, it's creating a lot of tension, like when you go to the state fair, like them getting fined and just all of the things around it. So it does come into our church. We are also starting our school. It's going to be starting next week. And we had to wrestle with some of the mandates. The deacons got together and really did some marvelous work. And what we kind of had agreed to do is not come up with specifics. What's our view on will we allow non-vaccinated people to come to our church? Will we mandate that all who work with students in our school or church become vaccinated? These are all things coming down the pike. So let me share with you four things. Four things that we as the deacon board kind of began to look about, what we call kind of values or principled or clarifying things that we kind of run the grid through on whether we're talking about masks or whether we're talking about vaccines, where we're talking about the booster shot, or frankly, what else comes down the road. And I kind of anticipate something else. I don't know. Um, I don't know if we're going to be mandated for our school to go back into streaming. All of those things are on the table. We hear about them. But what we're trying to do is to create some grid and framework by which we kind of think. Four things that we talked to the leaders of the school and that we're communicating to the parents. Number one, all the decisions that we make, we want to take into the totality of Scripture. Not just one verse. If you look at uh, Romans chapter 13, it says, obey the leaders. First Peter, the same thing. Then you look at other passages of scripture. There were times where the people of God chose to not obey. We don't want to look at just one side. We want to look at the totality of scripture. And whatever we come to, we want to look, if you call the whole counsel of God. That's one of our commitments. So some of you may come like, wow, how come, you know, uh, you're not defying the governor. She's trying to govern our uh, worship and others say, why don't you obey this? We're kind of trying to hold both sides. Number two, a principle um, that we're looking at, not only is our decision in alignment with the whole counsel of God? But number two is, are we encouraging people to come to a, what I call a position of conscience before God? In the book of Hebrews talks about, it says, to him who it is sin. What's the inference of that? There are some things that you do that for others it would be considered a sin. Some of you, you're going to go to a local pub and have dinner. Not a problem. Not think of it. Others look at that and think, man, I can't go there. Um, some people, anything beyond a G-rated movie, that's sin. 
Others go to a PG movie or whatever, you name the thing, and it's like it's not sin to them. The reality is there is a, some definition of sin. It's that which is offensive, out of alignment with God. But Hebrews seems to tell us that actually there's moments where we have to kind of press ourselves to what's God saying for us. Let me give you an illustration. When Daniel came and uh, he was invited to come into kind of the cabinet, if you will, and be trained, he said, no, not going to take it. You go back and look at that passage in Daniel 1, and there's a lot of people said, oh, the reason he didn't eat the dietary uh, offerings was because it was food sacrificed to idols. Well, the reality is text is not clear on that. People speculate on that. What we do know is, and what is my opinion, is he didn't eat it because he didn't want to demonstrate his dependence upon their dietary restrictions. He wanted to actually express his dependence upon God. You go back and look at that. What it comes down to is Daniel had a conscience before God. God has put a boundary on me. God has put a calling on me. And we want to encourage people. We're not giving you a, this is what you have to do, but rather we want to call all of our people, even our parents at our school, to come to that place where we call this conscience before God. A third thing that's really motivating us in relation to the school, but also in relation to the church, is that we see a complete erosion of parental authority over their kids. What it means is state practices are coming in in ways that mandate certain things that take the decision out of parents' hands. That doesn't mean every parent makes great decisions. But the reality is, it is our conviction as a church, even in our value statement where we say that we're family uh, friendly or family affirming, well, it's a little, even a little deeper than that. <laughs> we believe that God has given the ultimate authority over these children to their parents, to their guardians. And we as a church partner with that. We don't want to supplant that. Of course, when we bring everyone together, we're dealing with different parents, different families who have different value systems, and we have to have kind of a collective place. But when we make decisions here as a church, one of the things that's really influencing us is allowing parents to be in the place of ultimate authority and responsibility over their kids. Now, sometimes, to be honest with you, that can be a tension with some of the issues that may come our way. For example, if they get to the place where they're going to mandate vaccinations from 12 to 17 year olds to go to any school, which has been communicated to us quite a bit, we as a church have to wrestle and say, hey, do we support that? Do we say that you have to be vaccinated from a 12 year old to a 17 year old to come to our youth group? Or do we say to the parents, mom and dad, this is your decision. We're not going to entrust it. And there comes a point in my opinion, the church has to kind of decide um, where do we go? Do we allow the scripture to drive us in some of these decisions or do we allow public safety and some of those things? Now, I'm not trying to mock that. I'm simply saying from our perspective as leaders, we're watching this incredible erosion of parental authority. We don't want to be defiant. We're not saying to the governor, to anybody else, stick it to the person. That's not our heart. It's not, but we cannot take away what God has given to parents and families. So that's number three. Number four, in terms of the value grid that we're looking at is that we want to call people. We want to appeal to people to be willing to honor people and to sacrifice for the best of what others need. That means I may defer my freedom in certain areas to benefit another person. It means I may restrict myself to minister to another person. Now, if you think about those four, they don't solve everything. In fact, for some of you, they probably create greater tension. They kind of like, oh, I just want the law. I just want the rules. Well, let me give you another illustration. We'll come back to these four in a minute. In the New Testament, through the Bible, what's the standard to give, to tithe? Let's use that word. If you're a young Christian comes to you and said, what should I give to the church? What should I tithe? Probably the most common answer is the word 10 or, you know, is the assignment of 10%. Well, let's ask a question. Where does that come from? 
You go back into the Old Testament, you're going to see some illustrations of a tithe at 10%. But if you were to take the Old Testament and you were to ask, what does the conservative Orthodox Jewish person give? Probably in excess of 30%. Get into the New Testament. What's the standard for giving? Standard for giving, the only time it's ever mentioned in terms of a tithe, and that's in the Gospels. And that's actually where Jesus is kind of given a corrective to it. What's the real criteria for giving in the New Testament? Generosity, sacrifice, and joy. Now, if you're the kind of person who loves the rigidity of just tell me what to give, 10%, great, I'll do it. New Testament's not going to give you that. The New Testament's going to give you a way of thinking, generous, sacrificial, joyful. To be honest with you, that's harder. It means you have to go before God and say, God, what do you want us to give? Carrie and I have to go before God and say, God, all of it is yours. Everything we own is yours. How do you want to use it? See, that requires a lot more responsibility on your part. Much easier if I say, yes, give 10% and you're good. Same thing on this. Pastor, you going to allow people in the church without mask? Yes, straight up I will. Why? Because I'm not going to make a mask the barrier to say you can't worship. Am I going to call all of us to think about the needs of people? To care for people by honoring them? Yes, I will. Will we honor parents and their authority over their minor kids in relation to the church? Yes, we will. Why? Because those values matter to us. So we're going to take all of the scripture... We're going to take the conscience before God. We're going to take parental authority. We're going to take our love for others. And we're going to ask every one of us in our church. Now, you go home and wrestle with it. What does it mean when it comes to masks? What does it mean when it comes to vaccines? What does it mean to love a person who disagrees with me? I, I want to challenge you. And I do at the, at the heart, heart level for all of us is to take Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and following and put it into practice. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves every day with compassion, kindness, gentleness, humility. I guarantee you, friends, if every time we show up here for our school and every time we show up here as a church, that's our number one goal. We're not going to have any problems over masks. We're not going to have any problems over vaccines. We're going to come and say, how can I love people? There are going to be some who come on a Sunday morning, Saturday night, that aren't going to have masks on. And if you are a person who, if you don't wear a mask, you're a murderer, probably going to struggle. Uh, there are going to be some people who come with masks on. And if you're a person, who says, I will not let the government run my life. You're probably going to have a hard time. My question to all of us, all of us, Will I let God run my life? Will I let God teach me how to love people who are really different than me? Will I seek the unity of the bond of peace? So this weekend, we're going to come. We're going to be just like we've been. And that is we're going to focus on Jesus Christ. You're going to find some that we're going to say, yep, they're wearing masks. And I honor that. I absolutely support you in that. And there are going to be others who choose not to. It is I believe our responsibility to welcome people, to not police, to not say, if you don't live the way I live, then you don't get to worship with me. We'll have the, we'll have the same challenge when we get to the issue of vaccinations. Some of you have chosen not to get vaccinated and you're scared to death to tell people because you've had some people tell you if you don't get vaccinated, you don't care about people. Number one, you're never going to be asked that here. Uh, you want to tell me, that's fine. I live pretty openly, and I do that for a purpose. But the fact is, what I really want to challenge us is, let's listen to the whole counsel of God. Let's encourage each other to be moved by the conscience that God teaches us in our spirit. Let's allow the parents to be the authority and those who are directing their kids. And let's live to sacrifice for other people. If that's our spirit... When you come this weekend, whether it be Saturday night or Sunday morning, I think you're going to have the most incredible worship time in the world. I cannot wait to see you.
I hope you uh, can receive this on a Friday uh, well from my heart. We're just trying to prepare you how to learn to love in this crazy environment. Cannot wait to see you. My prayer is by Sunday, I'll have another haircut. If not, I'm just taking a Nazarite vow. And maybe I'll get my haircut when COVID is done. That's my vow. Eh, better not do that. Man, it's going to be down to the middle of my waist. I love you. Take care and we'll see you Sunday or Saturday.